Welcome to Commune, a global wellness community and online course platform featuring some of the world's greatest teachers. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, pass down wisdom, and bring the world closer together. This is the Commune Podcast, where each week we explore the ideas and practices that help us live this healthy, connected, and purpose-filled life. If you're hunkered down at home right now, this is a fine opportunity to check out our course platform at onecommune.com, where you will find programs from Marianne Williamson, Deepak Chopra, Russell Brand, Wim Hof, Brendan Burchard, Adrian Mishler, and many other brilliant personal development and wellness luminaries. Our courses span yoga, meditation, spiritual development, functional medicine, recovery, and social impact, essentially everything you need to be holistically well. Just go to onecommune.com. And if you are one of the superheroes on the front lines, a healthcare professional, supply chain worker, delivery person, scientist, biologist, or government worker, you will be stressed to your limits, both psychologically and physically. Even 30 seconds of deep breathing and grounding can help you stay centered and focused. We need you and we support you. So if you are someone on the front lines and could benefit from a meditation course on your phone, in your pocket, email me at jeffk at onecommune.com, and I would be honored to set it up. My guest on the show this week is the absolutely brilliant Ara Katz, co-CEO and co-founder of Seed, a company dedicated to the potential of the microbiome to improve human and planetary health. Our microbiome is a community of 38 trillion microorganisms, mostly bacteria and fungi, living in our guts, mouth, and on our skin. They are good tenants when we take care of our basic utilities, and in turn, they pay their rent by digesting our food, regulating inflammation, and synthesizing key vitamins, metabolites, and neurotransmitters. They are essential to our health. Today on the show, Ara and I discuss what humans do to enhance and destroy our good bacteria. We talk about birthing and bacteria. We talk about how we can make science beautiful and less clinical. We even talk about the spiritual dimensions of microbiome and how the understanding that we are mostly bugs can lead us to question notions of the self. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Ara Katz. My name is Jeff Krasno. And welcome to Kamiya. All right, cats, how's your gut today? Resilient. <laughs> Good. That's how I make all my friends. Just ask them how their gut is. <laughs> I also like to say, I'm not myself today. Because I'm actually not myself. Um, <laughs> and maybe that's a decent place to start. Why am I not myself um, from a microbiota uh, perspective? Sure. Well, tell me if it's helpful to first start off by aligning on our semantics. Um, <laughs> yes, please. Um, so the microbiome uh, is technically the collection of microbes and microorganisms that live on and within our bodies. That includes your skin and really any surface that touches the exterior world. We learned recently there's an optical microbiome. Um, But the reason that people usually refer to the microbiome and gut health kind of interchangeably is just because the majority of actually the 38 trillion microbes that live in and on you, a big majority of them do live in your your GI tract and your gut, um, specifically like lower GI tract. And they make up, you know, microbes make up about 50% of you by cell count. Um, there was a, a long time ago, uh, or, or, or even still today, some people use the 90-10 rule or, or, or stat, which has been kind of disproven in, in, um, in science and actually was kind of a, a piece of misinformation that just kind of kept getting repeated. Um, but the most recent count uh, that we work from is a Weissman Institute paper that puts it at about 38 trillion, which does put it at about half your cell, cell count, about equal to half your cell count. Mm. And That is why you're not yourself, (laughs) Um, because you are other, as as microbes kind of teach us, and three to five pounds of your body 
um, in exchange for some food and nutrients and a really warm place to live, um, takes care of you and is involved in a lot of functions in your body. And, you know, existentially, it's, it's really interesting and in the way you phrase the question, because, you know, the microbiome actually kind of does redefine our sense of self, um, particularly as we define ourselves as so different from other. Um, and that could be kind of anything, uh, you know, any either, either groups of people or just anybody else, because, you know, we really are kind of these te- teeming ecosystems. Um, we like to tell people that they are a coral reef or a rainforest, which is a beautiful way of thinking about it. Um, that we are actually referred to, there's there's kind of a, a technical term, holobiont, uh, which means multi-species organism or superorganism, which is another term for it. And superorganism or holobiont just means that you are a multi-species organism, uh, much to, much like a coral reef uh, mm. is. And so it's an interesting way of thinking thinking about ourselves, and and certainly opens up a lot of ways of thinking about how we're much more connected to one another and to the earth and. Um, than I think we'd like to think sometimes. Yeah, you've taken Although probably it. probably not your audience. <laughs> well, no, well, you've taken it actually quickly to the place where I eventually wanted to go, um, which is a little bit of the spiritual or metaphysical dimension of essentially not truly being ourselves or being in sort of a co-tenancy relationship with bacteria and fungi. Um, and... Um, and I started thinking about it earlier today of essentially all spiritual, well, not not all spiritual, but many spiritual traditions lead us towards this notion of self-transcendence that, you know, in every spiritual tradition, there's been kind of epiphanies around the illusory self, around mm-hmm. finding unity, a collective unconscious, Christ mm-hmm. consciousness, Brahman, Advaita, Moksha, on and on. And... But our day-to-day life, our quotidian life, especially in, in Western culture, is to think of ourselves very much as separate beings. And yes. that this individuation that we have starts the, with the belief that we are our bodies. It's very kind of Jungian. It's like my self, my my identity ends with my the my epidermis <laughs> you know that's it and <laughs> yes. you're a separate distinct individual living in an ex- an external universe separate from me separate from quote unquote god separate from nature um mm-hmm. but that really starts to break down um a- around you know if, if you start to ask and examine and contemplate the question am i my body well you know, you can start to talk, well, am I my four-year-old body? You have a four-year-old. I have three teenagers. Mm-hmm. Am I my 15-year-old body that was quite svelte? Am I my COVID body that's like mm-hmm. a little five pounds a little extra? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of starts to break down as, as many of our cells have died and regenerated. But this notion that we are mostly or 50% bugs, mm-hmm. it really does beg that spiritual question of like, am I really myself in a classic definition and if that if you're asking that then am i really separate from nature and from other people and that is a very different kind of conversation around the typical conversation of microbiome so i wonder if you have any other thoughts about that yeah of course i mean you know it's it's so interesting because i've been you know a yogi for a really long time and i i'm actually the daughter of an existential psychologist um and but also the, the also two atheists, which is an interesting and and you know the notion of like I, you know and 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 at the same time you know have been a long time aspirer to you know the the ideas of non attachment and certainly what that what that can mean and how freeing I think that can be and I I sometimes get hesitant around the ascription and patterns that these people who want to ascribe spiritual meaning to these things start to take the, take liberties in, even though in my, of course they feel very nurturing and warm and beautiful in their ideas. And I think that there's a lot of them, like I'll give you a good example. As you were speaking, you said some people think their body ends with their skin, right? Or that you end with your skin. 
But when you really, when you start to understand something called the exposome, which is literally this microbial cloud uh, in the in spiritual world, they would probably refer to it as an aura. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, there's literally a cloud that surrounds, like your microbes are not just on you. Like they actually, like there's literally a cloud around you um, that, uh, that is defined by many, many things, particularly environment, environmental factors. Um, and so there's, I, I, sometimes it's, it's not dissimilar to kind of some of the liberties that are taken in the leap from astronomy to astrology. And so one of the things that I do like to pressure test a bit when I get into some more spiritual and existential questions about this, which by the way, in a very human sense, I want to be true. So just start from that place that I, I would love all of those things to be able to just be copy and pasted into that framework. But one of the things that I do always cha challenge back about, and I, and I can speak to some of the ways that I think it can inform the way we make choices and the way we live and the think about our connectivity to one another. And I think sometimes those patterns and narratives are very, will serve, serve us, but sometimes the, the science thinker in me, or I, I should say the, the, the thinker that wants to avoid confirmation bias and not be attached to a framework and therefore go look into biology to support ideas and spiritual frameworks, because that's the way that I want to already see the world and therefore make that pattern fit hmm. what I want it to say is something yeah. that I do caution people about. Um, and I only say that not because those ideas are not beautiful and that they could serve us. Obviously, if everybody who is making policy around the oil and gas industry thought like that, um, I, I think we'd have a very different earth right now. So I do think that the ideas and the tenants are very valuable. What I sometimes get worried, no, I shouldn't say worried about, but just where I, where, where it doesn't resonate as much. And particularly, I'm just not somebody that delivers my agency to the universe. So I'm I, the, 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 the language of the universe called in, or this is what was called in, not because I'm not an incredibly spiritual person, but I sometimes think the way that we start to see patterns or start to take ideas in science or biology or some of these um, other disciplines, and then infer these patterns and then make frameworks around them as a way to make sense of our world is incredibly human, by the way, obviously a man's search for meaning, great book. Yeah. Um, and I understand like the love of astrology um, despite the fact that maybe many of those planets cannot actually be in retrograde ast astronomically, um, is that, and I appreciate where it all comes from, but I also, I sometimes wonder like if we're so interested in science, why don't we spend the same amount of time learning it and understanding it as we do some of these other disciplines instead of just trying to cherry pick ideas out of it that fits spiritual framework. So I say all that to say, Absolutely, biology shows us how deeply interconnected everything is. When you start to um, when you start to understand, like the exposome, or or even the exchange of microbes in a hug, in a kiss, in a handshake, yes. in in a in a in understanding how walking and being in nature increases the diversity of your own microbiome, how having a dog increases the diversity of your own microbiome, the way that plants interact with the microbes in our gut, the way that breast milk and microbes that come from the vaginal microbiome co-evolved to literally feed the growing garden in an infant's gut is extraordinary. But sometimes I say like, let it be extraordinary without layering on what you also want it to mean. Yes. I think that's, that's a very insightful um, comment. And I'll just close the sort of uh, the loop between kind of the alloying of silent of a sorry of science and um, and metaphysics with, and I'm certainly not a proponent of like well two crows flew past the harvest moon and I have a crystal right. on my doorstep and like you know whatever I'm not yep. I'm not going there, yep. But what I am interested in often is you know twenty five hundred years ago, you know. Uh, a man wandered through Nepal because he was interested in trying to solve the mystery of the mind and and came to the conclusion that our suffering is completely uh, 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 interrelated with endless craving and desire. And 
subsequently created Buddhism and meditation um, around that with no scientific basis whatsoever. Yes. Yeah. Yet that intuitive approach is some is now being supported through evidence based study. So mm -hmm. sometimes yes. I, I do think that there is an alloying of these two absolutely uh, things and and yes. Um, but I think the back to the empirical world of today and COVID, one thing that you brought up, which I think is uh, very prescient to the moment, is now, of course, we're, we're kind of in this coerced monasticism um, <laughs> and, and through social distancing and, you know, having to deal with health and or, immune or system. what I like to call self-proximity. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Um, <laughs> and what you say about the transfer, that our interconnectivity in some ways has been um, brought into stark relief like never before right mm -hmm. now in this particular situation. But, you know, obviously the best thing that we can do for one another is actually not be with one another, which is ironic, yes. I suppose. But, mm -hmm. but the transfer of microbiome of, ba of healthy bacteria through physical contact mm. is a really just compelling idea right now because I think there is a great worry that that's going away and we're going to sort of like limp back into a world of hand sanitizers and, mm. and elbow bumps. Yes. Uh, um, does that worry you? Um, we get asked this, you know, we get asked this a lot. I think it's, it's interesting. It's in, you know, some people, um, I was thinking about this the other day that in some ways like this is kind of the definition of a form of terrorism, right? Like it is truly, um, what it means like the, when a terrorist is the most successful, is when it really questions and totally changes the way anything you felt previously felt safe. Um, and I like, I, I, I do, I, I worry about it because of the way that these things are being communicated to the public. I think some of the things that I think are the greatest factors contributing to, for example, what we refer to as the climate change of our insides, um, which is really like this kind of despeciation or the just the decrease, literally the decrease of diversity of my bacteria that are in our guts that are actually being lost in one, two generations and can't be brought back just due to lack of like fiber, um, overuse of antibiotics, you know, other factors. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think in some ways there's, um, there's a, a way to look at it that says, oh, we'll start to, we won't hug anymore. And, and I think, and I, I think there's like, you know, it's not dissimilar to the stages of grief, right? Like you, there will be stages to this that have very, and depending on where you are and who you are and what your orientation is, and certainly what your experience was of this specific inception of this, that, and you can look at HIV. Um, you can look at, I mean, Ebola a little less so just cause it didn't end up really affecting the developing world in the same way, but you know, you can look at the history of, of these things o over time and really anything like nine 11, you know, I mean, other things that have caused like major disruptions in our sense of safety, um, and our place in the world. And I think that there will be, yes, I think, I, I don't know if hand sanit sanitizer is going away. Um, I think it will like anything, I think we're like in the Western world, especially we're, we're very like acute reactors. So like, we are just incredibly reactive and, and, and have very, and then like, not dissimilar to the way like Instagram feeds work, like it, although this would be slower, like, and then you just stop caring about it. It's kind of the reason that like, if you, if you, if you run a brand right now, like, you know, a campaign like lives for like a second. And I think this will absolutely impact the way we think about and take this thing seriously. But I think there'll also be some really like important humility that comes from it. I think that um, I think the the, the earth uh, is benefiting <laughs> at the moment, yeah. um, and I think that there's some a sense of uh, arrogance that we had previously that may, and I'm not as worried about hand sanitizer as much as forgetting some of the factors that went into this. 
Um, if you look, if you, as you, as you know, like obviously with the Holocaust, of course, people use the term like never forget, but there's a, you know, there's a reason, there's a reason that there, that, that exists. And that is because history repeats itself. And I think that there, ha- like, I, I actually hope things don't go back to the way they were in certain regards, because I, I'm not sure that was serving our earth as I think we are finding out right now. Um, but I'm not as worried about the more acute, like people, like I think hand sanitizer will kind of taper off, um, as the acute, um, concerns happen, uh, you know, with, with obviously transmission. Um, I'm not as worried about like ending in a world of just elbow bumps. Um, but I think that for sure, for a period of time, like the re, as, as you know, like the reintegration will definitely have some, a, a lot of murkiness and muddiness, um, to it, um, that we will have to find our way through that I think people aren't anticipating as much as it's easier to kind of just have a black or white situation right now, which is like only do this. And I think in the gray, like anything else and in the nuance, we will find ourselves for a period of time, like a bit more lost. You know, we're sort of often in the old paradigm, we're sort of born to think, well, you know, my, my parents passed me along this DNA, and that DNA sort of dooms me to a particular physiological or medical fate. I'm more likely to contact cancer, I contract cancer, I'm more likely to have heart disease, etc. And you can speak more intelligently to this than I can, but it seems like understanding more and more about our microbiome is saying, no, 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 that's actually not true. Yeah, there is some proclivity that you inherit, but largely you have a tremendous amount of agency that is determined by lifestyle, behavior, environment, diet, etc. I always tell men that like, if you truly understand the microbiome, it might be the closest you'll ever feel to being pregnant. Because when you, when you're, when you're, pregnant, like you feel this incredible accountability and like the lens through which what goes in is so different, is so uh, attuned to what is good for this child, um, at least for people who are going through pregnancy a bit more consciously. And so I always say to, to guys, like if you could just think of your microbiome, it's three to five pounds. So it's about the same weight, you know, for most of uh, up until maybe end of third trimester or mid third trimester. And I'm like, it's kind of the same idea. Um, and so I, I think there's, you know, there's a, yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. The actionability and the agency is extraordinary. And I think, and, and that's just, that's just the gut we're talking about when you start to understand your skin microbiome and the things that can be incredibly disruptive there, uh, when you start to understand, um, the vaginal microbiome for women, uh, for particularly for anyone in your audience who has like recurrent urinary tract infections, um, uh, bacterial vaginosis, uh, preterm birth. I mean, BV yeah. and UTI affects over 50% of women in the entire world, developing and developed worlds, yeah. for which there is currently actually no recognized primary standard of care. And so these are huge, distru- I mean, huge, distru- I mean, you know, and that all come from this ecosystem in our vaginas that are directly correlated with things like fertility um, and, you know, that long term health of, of that ecosystem. Um, and so anyway, just, to, but so, so yes, like I think as science also reveals more and more about these specific ecosystems, I mean, the oral microbiome, I think is going to be incredibly interesting as we start to understand neuro, neurodegenerative disease, for example. Mm. Um, that's been really interesting, new, new area of understanding like the blood brain barrier breakdown in certain neurodegenerative diseases and its relationship with the mouth and the microbes in our mouth. So yeah, I think, I think over time we're going to, that's going to be become even your, your question will become even more true. I just, again, always urge the sensationalism that sometimes come from extracting or evangelizing maybe a bit further than where the evidence is today. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I can feel that. I mean, you know, I, I, I follow Dr. Stephen Gundry to some degree and, and, you know, Uh some, some of the statistics that are put or that are posited, uh, around, you know, and I don't know if this is true, so maybe you could answer this question, mm-hmm. but that sure. your genetic makeup, um, mm-hmm. just because of the prevalence of bacteria in your gut, in your mouth, on your skin, 
and the DNA that it holds versus the amount of genes that a human has, which I think is yeah. from the human yeah, genome it's project. Nine, it's like, about 99 to 1. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, that you might, your DNA might look a lot more like your roommates than your dad. Yeah, it's totally conflated science. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's a nice idea, and it is a, a stat that gets thrown around a lot. And the, mm -hmm. the stat itself is correct. I believe it's about the, uh, DNA, uh, your bacteria express about 99 times something crazy like that, more DNA than uh, your, your human cells. Yeah. Um, you have to then ask the next question is, but, but for what? Right? Like, like, so the, like, it, like DNA, is not, it's not all created equal. Uh, meaning like, yes, it's all created equal. It's the same code. Um, but what it's coding for is different. And so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very reductive sensational stat that tends to get people's ears to perk up. Um, but you need to ask the next following questions, which is, uh, like, like my co-founder Raja always says, I'll take, I'll take some of my human DNA over microbial DNA all day. <laughs> um, so you, you really need to know what it's, what it's coding for and, and you need to be specific when you quote things like that, um, because it can feel quite sensational. Um, and the idea that like your, your entire human genome is going to look more like your roommates just, just because bacteria happen to express more genes is, is, is a, it's, it's a nice idea. And I trust I mean, as a marketer and someone who has to tell, get the narrative <laughs> out to as many people as possible about the microbiome. There's some, I, there's no one that wishes that that was more true. Right. Yeah. I was going to say you are an incredibly honest and perhaps reluctant marketer for your own product. Just, uh, but I think it speaks to your authenticity. You're, you want to get, yeah, you want to get the absolutely. science right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it speaks to our integrity. I mean, yeah. one of the things that we care so, so deeply about is the, in, and, and, um, aforementioned influence, people of influence, uh, in health and wellness, um, amongst many others, mm -hmm. um, I think often use some of these ideas to sell things in a way that's not exactly how they work. Um, and I think it takes advantage of people's misunderstanding, but more than anything actually propagates a lot of misinformation that when it comes to, to moments like COVID, yeah. you can't have it both ways. Yeah. And so I think we just care so deeply because we know that if you can understand and it's, it's the, you know, it's teach a human to fish, right? Like you could tell someone how great the fish is all day and make up all kinds of cool things about the fish. But at the end of the day, if they know how to dissect an article on any name, any of the wellness brand, you know, sites or any, you know, or just it, the way information is coming into them through an influencer on Instagram and can at least be equipped with asking the right questions. Yeah. That is so that the agency talk about agency, like the agency that comes from being able to ask questions is inc is extraordinary. And so we, what, what we try and say is not that, I mean, look, I believe deeply in our product. We're about to announce huge trial at Harvard. Like we, we just got authorized for our IND from the FDA, which means that it's like a product. I mean, it's a product that holds up as a, as a drug if we wanted it to be uh, just from like a, a safety efficacy perspective. But like it's, um, like we play the long game and the long game with human health is make, how could you empower people to make really good decisions? Not just, you tell people what to do all day. You're, you're as good as the next article, the clickbait that they receive or the next influencer that posts something. Yeah. Um, I want to come back at some point to ask you a question about pregnancy and bacteria, <laughs> but I can, we're on this kind of other jag right now. So let's we'll stay with it. Sure. Um, sure. Which is essentially, I think the, the problem the marketing problem that science has and yeah. uh boy is that in stark relief right now um you know given the fact that we have no dependable source of truth on cable news or from you know our government um and we need to look towards you know the cdc and the world health organization and and platforms uh, that aren't known for their marketing savvy per se. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, and you've addressed it a, a bit already, but how do you solve 
the marketing problem that science has without being somewhat sensationalist. And yep. maybe you tie that to seed because seed is, a, is very interesting. It, it, it just, I mean, I sort of at, at first don't even really know what it does outside. It just sort of like, it's this womb I want to return to, <laughs> you know, I know it has a product. I know that there's research, but I'm like a podcast no, we didn't guy. Know so. we have product. We don't talk about it. Very yeah. often. <laughs> um, which I think is really compelling and interesting. Um, yeah. But maybe you could poke at that for a moment. That yes. Thing. Yeah. For sure. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was laughing. I was going to say, I don't know what seed does, <laughs> but, but no, I mean, we, our through line is the microbial world and all we wake up every day to do is kind of pioneer like ways that we can apply microbes to solve issues in human and environmental health. So that's it like for us. And, and because we think of those two things as the same, obviously it's, um, it's a, it's a dichotomy we recognize, but not one that we embrace. Um, we, you know, our approach, and, and I think one of the things we've been recognized for, actually, we just got a couple of awards for it, is one outside of pursuing kind of rigorous science, um, both for consumer innovations and probiotics, um, but also on, on the therapeutics front uh, and, and, and microbes that will go through kind of phased trials to become drugs. That our UTI drug is one that we've spoken about publicly as an example. Um is, is that, you know, the, the same rigor and integrity that we apply to our products is kind of our approach with the way that science is translated and communicated. And we are always looking, you know, Marsh, Marsh McLuhan said, you know, the, the, in, the, in the 70s, you know, and, and it's one of the most resonating quotes, I think, for me um, in looking at this new world of where we are with COVID, it couldn't be more true, is that the medium is the message. We think a lot about what are the mediums and the doors that we could create that somebody could would want to walk through first. So that's saying, okay, how can you make science cool and accessible and feel culturally relevant? So that's one of the first things we think about, which is how how what are how could you do that? Like how do you how do you use like platforms like Instagram where the most egregious behaviors around misinformation actually happen or Facebook? And how would you, could you take that medium and change the message? So that's like, that's, and that's a big part of my, like my background in storytelling, which is like, you know, especially with technology and interfaces, like what are the, what are the gestures that you have to pull from people's existing behavior that you could say, but you could still learn science here while you're scrolling at night before you go to bed, while you want to click through stories, learn something. Yeah. You know, and so I think that's, you have to figure out like what, how can you meet people where they are? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I made this little social media piece myself called where is Walter? I think it's called where the hell is Walter Cronkite? Um, <laughs> yeah, because whether, funny. you know, you're on the right or the left, when he said it, it was just fact, whether you liked it or not. Um, yeah. And that there was, a reliable source of what was truth and factual that created a degree of social cohesion that allowed us to tackle problems um, communally. And yeah, I mean, when we can't even really agree on the numbers where, you know, there's the CDC saying one thing and on the, at the same time that there's a press conference about reopening America, <laughs> I mean, literally at the, in the same moment, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just very, very confusing. And, um, yes. and then, you know, well, so if, you know, some of our public institutions, if the erosion of, if there's erosion of trust there, well, then whose responsibility is it? Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson? I mean, <laughs> I don't know, you know, yep. so and you have to meet people where they are, where they are. I yep. mean, I often, you know, I, I look also at COVID as that the meme actually has a higher reproduction rate than the virus, you know? And so when people, you look at like how information spreads exponentially versus, yes. you know, yes. droplets on a surface, um, yeah. you know, that represents a tremendous amount of power and it needs to be um, dealt with, with a certain amount of, um, with, in, with integrity 
or you get essentially the Wild West, where any conspiracy theory can get a certain amount of traction to the point where otherwise rational people become vectors for theories that have no proven basis. And that's a, it's a very, very difficult landscape. I sometimes think of it as the end of truth. Um, I think that it is, it, it, I mean, it is truly beyond dangerous. Um, and the inability for anybody to evolve their opinions is, will be the end of us. Hmm. And, it, and truly, it's one of the reasons, like I always say, science is such a Buddhist, Buddhist discipline. The scientific method, which is like the idea that you pose a question, you have a hypothesis, you construct a set of conditions under which you would like to test whether or not there's truth or fact in even your own idea. And then there's a period of observation and then analysis and then a new question without any attachment. I mean, of course, I'm, I am speaking as a purist, obviously, and <laughs> you can get into many areas where, where of course, yes. there's... Um, I'm not sure that's the same MO for, that Johnson & Johnson uses, but yeah, yes, sure. I'm following you. Sure. But, yeah. but, but from an academic perspective or from yeah. just a philosophical perspective, since you did talk about other spiritual and philosophical disciplines, like the idea, the underlying idea of it is how do you ask questions um, without the attachment to outcome? And then chart a truth, a path to finding out whether or not something is true. Mm -hmm. I suppose there is kind of through cultural hegemony, media, whatever, that we are very good at sort of transferring what is culture to what is nature, which is essentially taking ideas that are posited about the human condition that are purely cultural and historical and making them universally true. Right. Like like America is the land of opportunity or whatever, mm -hmm. any slogan that you could possibly think of is, I suppose, an example of, of that transference from culture to nature. Um, anyway, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't really yeah. see the constitution or the Bible much, much more differently. <laughs> True. Yeah. Imagined. I mean, any kind sort of, of codif codified. Yes. A codified uh, like, set you know. of concepts that create an imagined order that are supposed yeah, to like create some sort of stability of in the world. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, you know, that, that, like, that's, that's not, that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll I mean, I was like, I mean, just to go back to the microbiome, like, you Thank know, there's you. great examples of like, you know, there's insects that don't have g microbes, right? Like, it's like, you know, it's easy to be like, all living things require like mi microbes. And then you find all the outliers and you think about, and then you realize that there's a lot to learn from the people, the, the species and the animals that actually don't have any microbes yeah. in them, you know? And it's, and so I think that's, that's all, I think that's what's so hard is like in a liberal democracy, I think that is a beautiful idea if there was a toleration of nuance and if the like yuckiness of how we've decided to enforce and how technologies have changed um, the way that those systems work, it's like so much of the ideas in, in so many cases is not bad, but it's the execution. Right. I mean, let's just go. I'll try to create a mildly graceful bridge yes. um, <laughs> where, for example, the innovation medical innovation, like around, for example, childbirth, C-section technology, if you will, um, is created for what one might argue under positive beneficial auspices, mm -hmm. yep. um, the health of the mother, the health of the child. Yeah. But of course, now what we're experiencing is through I mean, overusage of antibiotics, C-sections, everything essentially that happens in the hospital yep. sure. during childbirth, that, that children are losing healthy bacteria. 
Um, you know, vaginal and C-section is, is something that I always caution being too sensational about just because absolutely vaginal birth is more desirable f- for sure. Um, and, you know, there are places in the world like Brazil where the, the rates are just like pl- over 70% yeah. because okay. women don't want to disrupt their vagina. And there's a, m- many other cultural things that are happening. However, there is a lot of research that does show and, 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 and it's still up for debate that like in the absence of antibiotics and the presence of breastfeeding, an infant, a, a vaginal versus C-section baby's microbiome will start to converge. They will start to look the same after about a year to, to, to 24 months, depending on how long they're breastfed and, making, and, 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 and as long as there is not any administration directly to the, the infant of antibiotics. So I only say that because I, I, I sometimes I get very hesitant um, because so many women who have had no choice um, really get shamed a lot uh, and get a lot of messages that feel like they've kind of done a hu- such a huge disservice to their child if they had to have one. And so I just try and be incredibly sensitive to say that, yes, it's not the first most desirable way, but it doesn't mean that like you're fucked forever <laughs> yeah. if some of these other things, um, you know, uh, are, are, are other conditions are met. Um, and so I think that's just one, one thing to, to just to kind of mention. Um, but absolutely. And then breastfeeding being like another incredibly important part of it, because actually about a third of the carbohydrates in breast milk, which are called HMOs, they're called human milk oligosaccharides are actually not digestible by the human baby. Hmm. And they are only food for the infant's microbiome. Um, which just shows you from an evolutionary perspective, how extraordinary that is. And on top of that, there is bacteria on a mother's nipple that helps digest lactose, which you can just see from a nut again, from an evolutionary perspective, like how extraordinary this kind of dance and how we co-evolve with these microbes to kind of create this perfect situation to cultivate like the best garden possible. That is fascinating. I did not know that. That is fascinating. Yeah. And I, and I suppose just sort of the, just the co-tenancy uh, arrangement f- from the get-go, and, and I don't know if this is true, but maybe you can help me understand it, is that as the earth evolved and became more aerobic, essentially more oxygenated, yes. mm-hmm. that anaerobic organisms needed a place to go. Mm-hmm. And one of those places to go was our guts. Um and yes. that, and that we have this kind of sort of beautiful romance um, <laughs> there where it's like I used to kind of think of it as a sort of a landlord tenant kind of situation we take care of, <laughs> we take care of the the plumbing and yeah. you know and then they'll pay their rent or whatever <laughs> they can yep. have fun with that but it, it's really more of a um a commune yeah <laughs> i love you <laughs> yeah um yeah, it feels like it, right? Yes, it, yes, it does. I mean, it's as I said, it's always like um, it's. Yes, I mean, it it definitely does feel that way. I think they do get they get their what they need. Um, I think what you have to remember about like single celled organisms, and really most, I mean, many species in lowy biology, like biologists, I think think is you know. And, and this is how humans are wired, um, although this is where it gets incredibly perverted, which is we just want to persist. Like our biology is to persist. It's to continue life. And, you know, if you look at COVID or, you know, and, and, and you know, it's, it's that, and, and that is ultimately like one of the most interesting uh, con- constructs and, and certainly why bacteria got a bad rap um, by some scientists who, of course, attributed it as being almost entirely all pathogenic is really how we got here. Hmm. So to, to your right. point about like the importance of communicating science or other or, you know, a very, very small percentage of microbes are pathogenic or bad. Um, most of them are kind of what they would call commensal or, um, you know, some of them are many are neutral um, and, and many are symbiotic or, or benefit or, or beneficial. Um, and so, and, and, and more, more are beneficial and, or, and, or commensal. And so it's, 
You know, it's interesting because the the way we got here was basically the belief, and, and certainly this, you know, it, it, there there's other contexts to this. Like we had very different like sewage systems then. We had very different. I mean, there's there's a lot of reasons why disease, our communicable diseases, particularly bacterial based ones, you know, spread so quickly. There's context, obviously, to that because we are just a different. We live more in the built environment now, which has different protections because of the way we dispose of sewage. Um, and our exposure to the, to the things that made some of these things so pathogenic and, or, and at different parts in history. Um, but the built environment is actually the perfect place for a microbe to, you know, find, find, an, find replicate and find new hosts, i.e. what we are experiencing right now with COVID. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we, when I look at how like bacteria, the, the perception of bacteria has evolved over time, it is, it's fascinating that like we just, I mean, yeah, I mean, we just tried to kill it for a really long time. And I think that framework is, is actually partially what got, got us here. Um, and the question will be how, like to your point early question earlier, like how do we, how do we get out of this without trying to continue to kill it all? <laughs> right. Well, it speaks to an incredibly anthropocentric vision version of the world. It's sort of like a pre Galileo concept around biology or something where you know, the, and you could put yourself in into into another into another perspective. I mean, there is a what is the bacteria's eye of the universe? You know, what what does the universe look like through their eye, which is potentially not that different than us from a Darwinistic perspective. It's like we just are we could be seen as just sort of like meat wagons for our genes you know, through the gene's eye version of the, uh, version of the universe is like, all they want to do is, is replicate, you know, mute randomly, you know, select and then push forward. Mm -hmm. Um, and I suppose, you know, COVID, that's what COVID, that's what this particular novel coronavirus wants to do as well. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose from a bacterial perspective, that's what bacteria wants to do too. Um, and that there is a, um, uh, that there is a, I guess, a sort of a broader picture of looking at life, not through just the human eye. Um, yes, yeah, of course, uh, very much so, absolutely. I uh, I think that what you guys are doing at Seed is really, really fascinating and interesting. How you're approaching this subject is so innovative um, and also just feels beautiful. The... I don't know who does all your look and feel and design, but it's it's gorgeous, and I have a lot yeah. of thank you a lot of respect for that from a business thank you. Just pure yes. business perspective. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we do a lot. Well, I mean, but that that is a big part of communicating science, which is I think a lot of it is like the aesthetic of science. Yeah, never feels quite humanistic or beautiful. Um, again, it, it's not usually a door to walk through. Yeah, it's usually just feels incredibly cold and clinical and just kind of too complicated and. Um, or has that like biotech kind of like graphic that you've seen of like the human body and it's not, you know, and, and look, there's a reason that I think people like wellness and the aesthetic of wellness is so appealing because who doesn't want avocado toast that looks like that when you put it on a beautiful plate and you take a picture, you put your phone, phone above it. And it's like, you know, it's like, who doesn't want, like there's, there's a, a warmth and nur a nurturing quality and a, and a, uh, an aesthetic to kind of the way wellness has come up that I think is incredibly appealing um, and, and aspirational. Uh, and I think science ne has never really figured out how to meet people where they are like that. Um, it's one of the things we try and be kind of careful about just because I think in the same way that it is, of course, a world that we speak to, um, I have also found it to be quite exclusive Mm -hmm. um, and not very accessible to many. And so we try and try and be a bit, a bit careful actually about the, the avocado toast effect. Um, because I think I, I sometimes say wellness is the new Photoshop, which is, it has created an aesthetic that for many is actually not possible or that they don't see themselves reflected. And then I think we, we try and be careful there yeah. too. Yeah. No, you're absolutely correct. And I think, you know, that's why you see a lot of kind of polarization across, 
political, social, you know, where sort of the coast, this coastal approach to being is seen as sort of a feat and unconnected and, you yep. know, et cetera. So, yeah, well, I mean, we, we work in, I mean, you know, it's interesting, like, it, yes, it, it, it's a lot of people sometimes think probiotics are like this kind of coastal wellness thing. Um, but actually they're not, it's, it's very much driven by kind of two very main factors in the U S <clears throat> specifically, I can speak to other countries, but probiotics are regulated quite differently in other places. But for the most part, it's kind of two, two distinct use cases. One is GI health, digestive health, which we know is 60. I think there are last stat that we cited was 64 plus percent of Americans have GI issues, um, which is huge and, and a really big problem. And so really like probiotic sales are driven by, pretty, pretty dispersed because, um, of, of just how disrupted digestive is, di- digestion is in the, in the U S and of GI health in general. Um, you can look at like just even things like conditions like IBS, which affects like something like 12% of the population. Which is yeah. crazy. Um, and then, uh, and then really as a, as a complement um, or alongside antibiotics of which about 70 million prescriptions are written in the U S every year, over half of which are for things of non-bacterial origin, which means that it's not something you should take an antibiotic for. But what's happened is that pharmacists and doctors have started saying, you know, just make sure you take a probiotic either alongside or after this. And those are really the two cases, despite the fact that those two reasons are not really what everyone chats about on Instagram or what you see influencers always post about it. It, it is, it is, that's kind of what's driven the the probiotics business and um and then not to mention the fact that the term itself is not regulated in the u.s so oh, um so yeah. people can say probiotic anything in the u.s you can't do that in in most other parts of the world mm. um but that is part of why it's grown so quickly and, and most of those things that use the term are not probiotic at all yeah and I suppose that there's all sorts of varying degrees of probiotic versus live live probiotics versus probiotics that are essentially probably just an expensive pee. Um, um, it's there's no difference. So, so the scientific definition of probiotics was written for the WHO and the UN in 2000. Uh, I believe the first iteration was it in 2001, and it's been revised since. And and it it says that it's live microorganisms that when ad- then when administered in adequate dosages confers a health benefit to the human host or conf- confers a benefit to the human host, very specific scientific definition. If you unpack it, it means that it is an organism that is live. It's um, a dosage that has been adequately studied in, the, in, in whatever to, to whatever the, the, the end, the marker or the benefit or the clinical outcome that you're looking for. And has an, a benefit in the human host means it's been studied clinically and measured um, to have some sort of very specific outcome or marker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's an incredibly specific scientific definition. We wrote a paper about this last uh, last year um, called Probiotics, reiterating what they are and what they're not for both you know industry, but also for the scientific community because there's still a lot of misunderstanding and, and confusion and misuse of the term. Yeah. And it's not that confusing in science. Um, what gets confusing is the the lack of regulation around the term itself, which is why you can have probiotic, you know, tortilla chips, chocolate, pillows, uh, <laughs> and like every kombucha on the shelf claims to be that. Right. God, that's so fascinating. Um, thank you so much for your time. Yes. I know that you're running a business with a, <laughs> with a four-year-old in the background. And yeah. uh um, and I would love to, uh, I'd love to do it again. Cause I think that there's, there's, this topic is so rich and boundless. Um, and, uh, I really appreciate you taking out the time today. Thank you for listening to today's show. If you would like to learn more about Ara and her work at seed, just go to seed.com. And if you have any questions or comments about today's show, email me directly at jeffk at onecommune.com. I try to reply to every email. That's it from the commune for this week. My name is Jeff Krasnow, and I am here for you.